ok in the last term that we had talked about that traditional sigma deltas uh, work at low frequency at uh, low, low data rates. So, we are always greedy we want to now since sigma delta is so good and so cheap we want to use it as at as high a frequency as possible. So, uh, there is some work that uh, a couple of students of mine Avagupta and Lokesh Kumar had done in this area. So, this uh, presentation uh, includes partly uh, their input. So, due credit uh, to them uh, and this uh, we did discuss some of the issues that I had raised, but we would like to go through the details of uh, what are the options that we have in making in raising the frequency up to which sigma delta can be affected. So, up to audio there is no problem, but can we in fact go to somewhat video like frequencies using sigma delta. So, we will see the problems and see the resolution. So, this was uh, essentially our aim to get high resolution this 12 to 16 bit is the standard kind of resolution that you are looking for uh, in a sigma delta. If you want less resolution then it is hardly worth the bother of uh, uh, doing all that DSP kind of work that you need to do in the digital filter afterwards. Uh, and since the speed is high 10 to 12.5 mega samples per second it is not practical to expect resolutions much higher than 16 bits. So, this is roughly the regime this also happens to be the uh, and this also happens to be the video uh, coder encoder range ok. So, this is this of course, now uh, we all of us uh, know that high resolution can be achieved even while using relatively low precision analog circuits as long as you can over sample by a large amount. Uh, so, we want to now see can I uh, in fact raise the uh, uh, can I raise the frequency to which we can go and this is essentially the uh, the signal equivalent of uh, uh, a first order actually uh, this thing otherwise you will have a raise to power m there. So, a first order sigma delta that you have uh, you treat the uh, quantizer as if it is adding a random error. The advantage of this as we had discussed before is that now you can treat it as if it is a linear element otherwise the quantizer is a non-linear element and a non-linear element you cannot do signal analysis of this kind this is linear analysis. So, what you do is that you pretend that the quantizer is actually an adder and it somehow knows how much of voltage to add. So, that the input voltage when added with this voltage arrives exactly at the resolution voltage at the reference voltage ok. And it is assumed that this voltage that you need to add to arrive exactly at the step voltage is random is uncorrelated with the signal it need not be fully random, but it is not correlated to the signal. This assumption is sometimes weak and when it is violated then you start getting secondary effects in your sigma delta modulation, but currently we will make that assumption. So, for example, what it says is that let us say that your resolution levels are plus and minus 0 0.5 volts. So, if you had 0 0.3 volts then it will be zapped to plus 0 0.5 volts, if you had minus 0 0.1 volt it will be zapped to minus 0 0.5 volts. So, this is a very non-linear device. So, what we say is that we have this magic adder and when 0 0.1 volts arrive it adds 0 0.4 to it, when minus 0 0.1 arrives it subtracts 0 0.4 from it etcetera. So, it always adds or subtracts the right number which takes it to the resolution level. Therefore, our quantizer is nothing but a linear element which adds in short all the magic of non-linearity has been taken out of the quantizer and put inside the signal which we now have to invent which we will have to add to our signal. So, that it always ends up at the quantization level. So, now our circuit is linear, but now we need to know the statistical distribution of this number that we need to add to the signal. So, having made that uh, trick now we have a linear circuit and uh, you can write down essentially the uh, the transfer function of that. Assuming this transfer function and this by the way we are going to do have a tutorial on this. So, I will give these tutorial problems and different parts of this uh, you really have to understand this uh, expression and to derive it in class is somewhat uh, boring to be honest. Uh, all there is nothing very great about it, but you have to just uh, bite the bullet and do it once. 
I will discuss this expression partly with you. So, this 10 log sigma x squared minus 10 log sigma e squared, sigma e squared is the sigma is the amplitude of that magic number that you have to add. So, this is essentially the power in the quantization error band and this is the signal band ok. So, this is essentially the natural uh, signal to noise ratio that you will get from 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 this because you are adding noise and then this is the shaping function. So, this is because of the noise shaping, shaping of this noise some you have swept out of the band. So, this expression is arrived at by assuming an ideal filter uh, infinitely cheap filter which is not practical, but you for, for this you assume that you have an ideal filter which is exactly aligned with your signal pass. That means, all the power outside of this region is to be subtracted out ok. So, because of noise uh, because of uh, this thing you have this and this is essentially the uh, oversampling ratio. So, F s by 2 F b is the Nyquist frequency and F s by 2 F b then essentially says how much above the minimum required frequency is your clock frequency. So, the uh, higher it is the better it is because then you can improve your signal to noise ratio ok. So, that is I have just borrowed the same equation here. Uh, that, so, assume that uh, we get this expression we will derive this um, step by step later. So, what can I do? For example, suppose because my F b is high I cannot oversample by the same large ratios that I did earlier. So, what I can do is to increase the effectiveness of this term F s by 2 F b by having a larger uh, level of integrator that means second order third order or whatever. Unfortunately, my choices are quite limited here that is to say the modulators with uh, greater than 2 integrators can be unstable. Uh, generally, it is very difficult to get to design something which will remain stable in spite of, remember you have a feedback. So, therefore, if you have essentially uh, a second order third order, second order is about all that you can manage easily and uh, above that it is quite a challenge to uh, design stable uh, feedback circuits. We can increase the oversampling ratio of course, but to begin with that is not possible we are doing all we can that is the first thing that you do in sigma delta go to the highest possible uh, oversampling ratio to get the best possible resolution. However, because F b itself is high you do not have too much choice and therefore, finally, use higher resolution of course, ADC and DSC. How will that help? If you do not use a 1 bit ADC, but use a higher resolution ADC DSC from this expression how does it follow that that will help? Sigma e squared is much smaller right. So, sigma e is of the order of the LSV. The number that you add to bring it to the nearest level will be much smaller now if there are uh, well spaced uh, closely spaced uh, levels. So, therefore, the amount of voltage that you have to add to bring it to one of those levels will be now correspondingly smaller. So, if sigma e itself is smaller then you can have much better uh, this thing. Unfortunately, as we have discussed earlier that uh, you know a 1 bit DAC is by definition linear that means, there is no further nonlinearity. you have a V ref which is nice and simple and you are not using any analog quantity other than V ref. So, on the other hand if you use a multi bit DAC then the value that you subtract is the result of the output of this DAC and if it has non-linearity uh, departure from ideal then that will be fed as if it is a signal and it will appear without any attenuation at the output and it will quickly essentially that means, your sigma delta modulator is as good as your DAC and the whole idea of using a sigma delta was that your analog circuitry uh, can be relaxed. So, now if essentially we are looking for a way of relaxing the requirements from our DSC, then only we can go to high speed. So, then uh, one thing that we had discussed yesterday and that is to use a cascaded architecture. What will cascaded architecture do? It artificially improves the order of the integrator, but the feedback is not global. Essentially what happens is that if you have 4, let us say you have 2 second order uh, cascaded 
uh, sigma delta A D C. We discussed the cascading of these last time. So, if you have two of them, that is equivalent to having a fourth order sigma delta A D C. But the why is it not unstable then? It is not unstable because the feedback is not over four integrators. Each one of them has feedback over two orders. So, this the stability is much better. There is no feedback from the first sigma delta A D C to the second sigma delta A D C which is doing the conversion of the residue right. So, what we did was that we built up the residue and applied yet another sigma delta on it and subtracted out the uh, error right. So, that is just a straightforward operation there is no feedback in that. Therefore, even though you have subtracted out the second order term by putting one more uh, sigma delta here uh, there is no uh, problem of stability. So, that is one possibility that we can uh, consider. However, like all cancellation issues, this is a critical issue. That means, if your components are not just right, if your cancellation is not perfect, then it makes the most effect where the cancellation should have been uh, exact. That means, the departure from ideal is maximum where you want it most. So, where the error is 0, you are essentially taking two large quantities and taking their difference. If the two are exactly matched, then the cancellation is perfect and the error is 0. But on the other hand, if there is even a small percentage mismatch in that, then the residual error will be most effective where it was expected to be 0. If the residual error itself is large, then the mismatch does not matter. But the place where the residual error is supposed to be 0 and here, you are cancelling errors. So, you are taking two large errors and subtracting them out. And therefore, your requirement of matching is very, very high. That means, the two sigma delta modulators, their behavior should be as you model. And if the actual behavior of the sigma delta modulator departs substantially from the uh, model, then you have a problem. Because you may think that you have subtracted out the error, but you have not subtracted out all of it. And the residual error will then dominate your uh, overall uh, sigma. So, this is the cascaded architecture. Uh, and as we have discussed that day, that essentially you have this is the quantizer 1, ok. Now, notice that the picture, the simplified picture that I gave you last time was as if the first one has completed its, co completed its uh, uh, conversion and then you are passing the residue to the other, right. That is what we do in pipeline. The one bit thing has finished its job, then you pass the residue. But here the residue is distributed even as you are uh, completing the first order of uh, conversion. The only saving grace is that there is no global feedback here. So, therefore, uh, you have this signal here which comes and uh, then you take this, this is the residue, right. This is the output of the DSC and now you take this output back and this, this is the residue. Actually, it is multiplied by some factor and pass it through yet another one. Now, what happens is that the uh, error does not quite have the same transfer function in the two, which must now be corrected. Remember, the error here had a transfer function of 1 minus z inverse kind of thing, 1, one upon 1 minus z inverse kind of a thing. And the signal had z inverse, right. But here, your error has become the signal. So, the error is not coming through unchanged it is coming through a pass through through some transfer function. So, the transfer function here is z inverse, the transfer function is 1 minus z inverse. So, what you do is you multiply this by z inverse digitally and multiply this by 1 minus z inverse. So, you have a filter which will have that and then cancel them ok. This has become necessary because the feedback is the error correction is distributed rather than being all together ok. So, essentially what you are doing is that you have multiplied this by the transfer function of the signal ok. So, you have essentially multiplied this by the transfer function of the signal and this by that of the error ok. So, essentially the residue now has the same overall transfer function and therefore, when you cancel it will cancel out exactly. So, that is the trick that we want to use and this is called the cascaded, uh, this is called a 1 1 cascaded. Uh, sigma delta ADC because both of them have the first order here. You can also have second order, second order, or second order, first order, all sorts of combinations. So, this is then the uh, uh, architecture that we are talking of. 
So, what is y 1 z that is this this output right this is x this is y 1 this is e 1 and this is y 2 ok. So, what is y 1 z it is x z into z inverse this is the signal noise uh, tr transfer function plus e 1 z into 1 minus z inverse right this is this is the uh, error transfer function and y 2 z gets this e 1 z actually it should not be from here I think there is a. So, e 1 z into z inverse plus a new error now which is the final residue e 2 z into 1 minus z inverse and if you multiply essentially we are trying to cancel this term ok. So, you multiply this equation by this and this equation by this and subtract then this term will cancel this term. So, essentially the first term will then vanish ok. So, that is what we are doing we we have multiplied by this multiplied this by this term this by this term and then subtract and then essentially you have only the square term left of 1 minus z inverse ok. So, this square simply means that now you have got a second order uh, integral and this was the first order and first order. So, essentially what it means is that the first order error is cancelled and you have just added effectively the order of the uh, integrator without having the global feedback on this. So, the residual error is now cancelled out to the order of the upper one and the error which remains is the cumulative error through this and this that means you have passed it through the integrator twice and that is why you will have a pass function which is equivalent to second. Now, a second one could have been second order could have been made directly that is not such a big uh, problem, but now by using two second order sigma delta modulators you can now have a fourth order two inputs correct, but what she is doing is that she is summing them independently rather than part of that because it will load and make it slower and so on ok. So, essentially you you what you are saying is that you could have just used this summer ok correct, but what she wants is actually what she has done is that she has taken this z inverse upon 1 minus z inverse and subtracted that from here from the signal ok from the output. So, that that way you will be left only with even z right you need the ratio of these two is not it to have only even left from y 1 z you need the ratio of these two is not it. You want the ratio of z inverse and 1 minus z inverse to get only the even z out of y 1 z right. So, that is why she is subtracting input multiplied by this ok. So, that you are left only with e of z. So, therefore, you need a separate summary and this is the equivalent of the second order dual quantizer. So, you have one quantization here and this is the final output and you just multiply them by, by the two uh, transfer functions and get the error cancellation. So, what we said was this looks ok in MATLAB. So, let us just actually build it. Now, notice one problem this behavior is in the analog portion right. So, therefore, this is just a model of the actually more complicated analog circuit this is not exact. On the other hand the multiplication by these transfer functions that is in digital domain that multiplication is exact right as a result the cancellation is not likely to be perfect unless your model of the analog transfer function this is just you are thinking this is an integrator with a delay. So, this is its transfer function, but in fact this will have lots of problems. For example, you are assuming that you have an op amp with an infinite gain only then you get a good integrator, but the op amp is not going to have infinite gain it is going to have finite gain. 
therefore the output is not quite going to be the integral it will be slightly deviated from the integral right so therefore the assumption of this transfer function is only an approximation on the other hand what you are multiplying is truly z inverse by 1 minus z inverse because that is just a digital multiplication by some scaling factor so as a result this is uh, uh, this can have some residual error so what we did was we actually designed the circuit with this and uh, when we actually do the circuit simulation indeed we find that the cancellation is actually not perfect and there is some leftover error uh, in the in the circuit so uh, this uh, <coughs> this uh, imperfect uh, cancellation is called leakage of quantization noise see normally what were you thinking you were blocking the first order quantization noise so that was supposed to be exactly cancelled and only the higher order quantization noise was supposed to come to the output however because the cancellation is not perfect some first order quantization error has leaked into your output so that is called leakage so what we can do is to have adaptive digital correction the what adaptive digital correction says that i have a filter and i have started out by saying that these transfer functions represent my analog voltage okay but really my analog is not what i had assumed so suppose i have an adaptive filter which automatically adjusts itself so that it mimics the true analog function then we will have a better design okay so as an initial guess we will have that transfer function z inverse 1 minus z inverse and so on so we will have a filter and we will initialize the taps tap values and so on so that it starts out with that but now i need some some way to train my filter and i will change my coefficients in such a way so that such that the error is reduced okay so in short what it says is that look i can't make an ideal analog integrator what i will do is that i will make my digital multiplier mimic my non ideal integrator but unfortunately i don't quite know its transfer function so i must have some way so that i can train these multiplying factors so that on subtraction the error is minimized okay so that is the purpose of this so essentially if the factors are not exact then you model the leakage this 1 minus z inverse term should have been zero right because this should have been exactly cancelled but because the cancellation is not exact you say that the overall leakage transfer function does include a small coefficient here which is of the order of 1 minus z inverse and then 1 minus z inverse squared and 1 minus z inverse raised to power m okay so you model it as if the residue is of this format okay and now you want a filter which will then cancel out this term right and the coefficient of the filter should be such that this term is now cancel out so what you are doing is making an adaptive filter now there are two kinds of adaptive adaptive uh, filters which we use one needs to be specifically trained the that means you give it a give it a control signal whose value is known okay so that the error can be checked back so it essentially sets the filter parameters till the error for this standard signal is zero okay so for example you may give it a sinusoid and then the digital output should be a sinusoid to fourth order or second order what you are doing not there should be zero error at the first order okay so you pick out that first order term and adjust these coefficients automatically till that error goes to zero okay so then there are standard techniques of uh, tuning uh, adaptive filters and this is quite a common one which essentially says that uh, this is called block least mean square algorithm so what it does is that it collects outputs remember the output is staccato output is clocked so it collects the output and finds the mean square error over a number of uh, clocks and finds the sum and then adjusts the coefficient okay if this sum goes down then it adjusts some more in that direction otherwise it goes back in the old direction so it keeps on adjusting the coefficients 
till this term is minimized. Okay, so this is a very standard way of tuning uh, uh, filters, tuning uh, adaptive filters. So you wanted to have a certain output, then you give you have your your components are uh, non-ideal, so you don't know their true transfer functions. However, you have a control signal for which the control output is known. So you con you compare the control output with what you actually got and adjust the filter coefficients in the direction which minimizes this out, this difference this error signal okay so that is that is essentially what you do and there are various parameters for this for example remember if you did this correction too often then that will be bad why will it be bad suppose, suppose all the time i'm looking at the error and correcting my uh, coefficients why would that be bad okay you have all done correct so it will be responding to noise right so you, you want to say that this error is well and truly the error and if it is just fluctuating either side of it then you should average it okay only then change the coefficient okay but suppose you change the coefficient anyway what is the problem The problem is that you have now inserted a new kind of noise in your system and this new kind of noise is called the coefficient noise. Let us say that your system was ideal okay, and you were in fact at the minimum error, but the system does not know that the error cannot be reduced below this. So what will it do? Once in a while it will change the coefficients and bring them back. So, all coefficients will be changed by small amounts and brought back. As a result, the output transfer function will fluctuate around the minimum, right? Because the transfer function is not constant, it does not stay put at the ideal value, because even at the ideal value, it is impatiently trying to find something better, right? So, as a result, you now have an extra component of noise in the output, which is not because of the quantization noise that you had introduced. It is because your coefficients are hunting about. Okay, so now there is a golden mean. If you do not adjust your coefficients very frequently, then your coefficients will stay put for longer periods at optimum points, and you will have less coefficient noise. On the other hand, it will be less uh, adaptive. It will not adapt to the changes in system. Suppose your temperature has changed, your gain has changed, or the voltage has drifted or the gain at this signal level is different from gain at some other signal level. So, dynamically the transfer function is actually not constant, okay. You have a complicated analog circuit which you are simplifying and saying that it is like this. Actually the gain itself will change with the operating point and so on. So, therefore, you need to correct it more frequently by this argument and less frequently by the other argument. So, therefore, you need to have some proper choice of this block. So, you choose saying I will not change it all the time, I will accumulate the error for k blocks and then adjust my coefficient and I will choose my k astutely so that it is neither too low nor too high, okay. So, that needs to be done, okay. So, this is then uh, in this k is the block size, so k is the uh, size over which you are taking the sigma of this uh, error term and uh, you have a adaptation size okay uh, that means by how much what is the value at the current stage jth stage of adaptation what is the value of this these coefficients this a is the array of the co coefficients okay so a is considered all coefficients are supposed to be one word whose various bits you are changing okay and uh, gamma is an adaptation constant. So, what we do is actually we zap it to a 0 or 1 value. So, gamma is the amount by which we change this word, okay, to make it higher or smaller. So, this is another thing that we can adjust to get good adaptation. If what will happen if gamma is too small? What is gamma? Are you with me or not? I am not getting the usual uh, ocular feedback from you. 
what have I got? I have got a, I have got a coefficient array, right? And I am going, so various coefficients are there. And I am going to fiddle with these coefficients. Now you all agree that I am not, should not fiddle with them too often, okay? So k is that. So I am going to accumulate my error over k inputs and then depending on how much error I have accumulated, I will change my coefficient. But by how much I will change that coefficient, that is gamma. All right. What is the proportionality constant between the error, accumulated error and the change in the coefficient, that is gamma. Okay. So now, now you understand what is gamma. Tell me why, what will happen if gamma is too small and what will happen if gamma is too large. Okay, if gamma is too large, then you will be hunting all over the place, right? You need a little bit of change and you are essentially being very, uh, rather than adjusting it just, just right and sort of dancing along with the variations, there are little variations. You are taking brute steps in plus and minus direction, causing all sorts of havoc. But why can't gamma be small then? It will adapt, but it will adapt too slowly, okay? Because remember, you have a chance to correct every k. And if you uh, adapt by very little, then you will require lots and lots of such cycles before it starts inching towards the proper uh, uh, value of the adaptation coefficient. So therefore, obviously, all of these parameters need to be adjusted carefully for the system that you have, okay? For example, you might have a system in which the integrator is quite good and the initial function that you assumed was quite close to this then obviously you do not have to correct very frequently. Then the optimum might be to adapt by small amounts and less frequently. On the other hand, your system might be quite far from the assumed value and you may have to hunt over large values and then obviously the adaptation gamma as well as k now need to be adjusted for that. So therefore, there is no, you finally, when you have built a system, then you have to do your simulations and find out. Now notice that this is now a mixed kind of bag the values of the coefficient etc digital filter right that is that is taking place at a low frequency whereas this whereas the circuit you have to do proper circuit simulation if you had a model then what's the what's the problem you that is where you started out from then you should have got an ideal sigma delta modulator but the main problem is that the integrator the analog components the d2a converter they are not ideal right so therefore what you have to do is a circuit simulation over this using a step which is much smaller than the clock frequency and then a digital correction, right, which is a digital uh, simulation, not an analog simulation. So, you do a digital simulation there, which occurs every k clock cycles or whatever, right. So, you have, you really need to have a, and this is by the way, a, uh, one of the major headaches of uh, mixed signal people. For example, you have done all these uh, uh, switch capacitor uh, filters. What is the requirement of a switch capacitor filter? Major requirement in terms of clock frequency. Clock frequency has to be very much higher, right? So then, if you start doing detailed circuit simulation, what step size do you choose? Since clock is occurring at this very high rate and there is a sudden transition of all the way from 0 to VDD, every clock, that means your time step has to be quite small and the time, time step has to be small with respect to what, signal or the clock, clock, that is very small indeed. So therefore, if your clock to signal ratio, frequency ratio is very large, then you have to do many, 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 many signal step before you get one cycle of your analog input, okay. This is the problem always. That means essentially when you introduce a discrete element in an analog system, then you are already assuming that this discrete element is at a frequency far removed from the analog, so that you the two, two do not get mixed up. And now you start using essentially something which is frequency transparent. You know, analog simulation is supposed to be the same at high frequency as well as low frequency, then you end up doing too much work, okay. So this is a big problem and in our case it was done painfully. So you do your uh, uh, signal and do only up to k times, right? Then you find out the accumulated error, change it manually and then continue your simulation with changed coefficients beyond, okay? So all the digital part was being, being done almost manually and the signal circuit simulation was being started all over. 
okay the circuit will freeze after k clocks we would have collected all the digital bits by that time then from that history we will run a matlab program which will do all the digital correction etc etc come up with the new value of coefficients we will put those new value of the coefficients in the circuit and then restart the circuit simulation and do it okay so this is this, these tricks like this have to be used there are some special purpose uh, mixed signal simulators in the market but if you have only the standard simulators then often tricks like this have to be used okay so next we went to the problem that we had discussed earlier saying that look our quantizer and the dac should not be single bit because if they are single bit then it is just just too much work to uh, to correct all this so essentially we are attacking on all fronts right what were the various options that we talked about that we have to improve signal to noise ratio increase order right so we increase the order the way only way we can that means use cascaded with cancellation when we did cancellation we found out that the cancellation didn't work as well as we had hoped and then we found out the reason for that because the digital model through which we are cancelling was not accurate and the residual error was bad enough to just take us completely away from what we want right so then we brought in this adaptive filtering so that at least to the extent that we can bring it so now we have let us say to some extent raise the order of the integrator without becoming unstable and without having too much residual okay then the next thing is of course uh, the whole problem has started because we cannot over sample by a very large ratio right because if we could do, do that then we would just do that and be done with it so the next thing was that you reduce the value of sigma e right and that can be done only by using a multi bit so multiple multi bit a to d is not a problem okay use a flash even if your reference values are not quite linear it's all right because that is passing through the same signal where the error is entering right the error of the uh, sigma uh, of the a to d converter is entering at the same point where the quantization error is you are simply saying that the quantization error is not equally spaced right but whatever is the quantization error that is being brutally suppressed by our shaping but the d to a error now that is the next thing that we have to look at. okay so this by the way uh, i have told you how we went about the simulation we just divided the whole circuit into these three things and did all of these uh, one after the other okay and in this particular work i am not talking of that uh, other thing that is not on the transparencies i'll just describe that later of how we tackle the d2a problem okay that was done by a third student you need lots of students before anything like this uh, starts work so that is not included in this but remember that the digital design is also actually quite complicated because remember each now this output has to be collected right and it has to be appropriately delayed this uh, so for example the correction of this bit has to be with respect to the corresponding delayed bit there right i'll just tell you what i'm talking about. so this is our architecture right now let's say that the residue came here in some clock now after passing through this this guy will arrive much later right so therefore in order to cancel it you must introduce appropriate delays this output because remember here we are happily talking about z inverse 1 minus z inverse and so on actually you are getting some 1 2 4 bit output every clock so you can't start correcting with what you see at the output of the corrector block right now and the output of the corrector block later at at the a to d okay so that that will not work because this error doesn't correspond to that doesn't correspond to that sample so therefore you must have an appropriate delay element okay and that delay element must be correctly calculated right because how much delay is there that depends on your implementation right so notice the circuit here 
So, there is going to be some delay through this and through this which will then have to be clocked right and then it will go through this which will be which which itself will be clocked right. So, you have to calculate how many clock later the corresponding uh, uh, error will arrive here and then correct the error of a particular bit with its error not with some arbitrary different sum ok and also the loop around time of both has to be optimized accordingly ok because it cannot happen that this is operating at one clock and this is operating at another clock right. So, both of these have to be as identical as possible. So, therefore, the digital circuit apart from the usual uh, circuit of uh, digital filter and so on has to correct the errors meaning uh, has to put in delay digital delay lines which will correct the outputs. So, essentially this is the uh, these are these are the outputs right. Now, notice that the output is to be collected all 10 bits are to be collected and then corrected right. So, while they are being uh, we are doing the corrections after collecting all the bits ok. So, you collect those bits multiply them then subtract out and then take the output and appropriately inserting arrays depending on how much delay your digital and come analog circuit has appropriately inserting the proper arrays in each path. So, that everything corresponds to the same thing. ok. So, this is this simply tells you that Abha Gupta like animations. So, you uh, then do the adaptation algorithm implementation and the this is the actual circuit which is used for that uh, adaptation algorithm ok. Somehow this is not very clear I have to need keep looking back yeah. Now, this is the uh, adaptation uh, algorithm come uh, the uh, come uh, filter. Now, generally the filter that we use up to now we have not talked of the digital filter at the output. The filter that we use is uh, you might think that you will have some huge uh, uh, adaptive filter etcetera etcetera, but the commonly used filter is called a comb filter ok. This comb filter is nothing but accumulate and dump that means you take a remember we are oversampling. So, we have to combine lots of readings into one reading before we correct it. It is that which causes that error the timing error right. So, what you do is that you accumulate a certain number add a certain number of readings let us say you have oversampled by some factor m. So, very simple minded actual systems are much more complicated that you add up m samples and dump the sum ok. So, what kind of filter does this constitute? What kind of passband do you expect of, of an accumulate and dump? Assuming that the error is random right. So, now you say that the error has therefore, a even frequency distribution. So, now I want to see what comes out if you feed essentially white noise to this filter what will come out at the output if you have this accumulate and dump right. I do not want you to do start doing algebra you should get a gut feel of what is happening here. What kind of uh, output do you expect from an accumulator in the dump? Like correct, correct. It is it, it is not quite a moving average it is yeah, but it is it is just taking taking some then dumping it. So, essentially what happens is that it has a very strange look. It has a shape which is somewhat like this. So, if you look at this envelope, this envelope is just a low pass filter and that you expect whenever you integrate you are taking average. So, you expect a low pass filter. However, apart from that low pass filter, 
it has sudden zeros and because of this it is called a comb filter these look like teeth of a comb okay so why should it have zeros and multiples of that right what happens is that there are certain frequencies so i have resolved this random simple as a sum of all sine sine waves now i am looking at sine wave by sine wave that is what i mean by spectrum right so suppose i have picked a frequency in which an integral number of cycles comes during the accumulate cycle an exact integral number of cycles is included in particular let's say one one cycle right so if you accumulate at the only this part of the signal that means you are averaging sin x over one whole cycle so its value is zero right so the response to this particular frequency is zero and if you have two full cycles again you have zero right so any multiple of that frequency and your frequency your filter is much better than what you had thought at exactly those frequencies okay around that then it starts rising because there is a residual part of the cycle uh, it is not an exact multiple and what residue part of the cycle is there that will decide how much response remains at that frequency so while it is overall a low pass filter which is what you wanted because you want to cut it off at the uh, this thing if you place these zeros at the harmonics of the clock okay so remember your clock is introducing lots of uh, discrete power into your signal so if you properly place these uh, zeros uh, at multiples of clock then you will remove all the discretization that you have introduced because of the clock in there okay so this kind of a filter is called a uh, a comb filter and very often you use uh, unless you are trying to do adaptation and so on you uh, very often use the comb filter okay so the standard vanilla flavored um, sigma delta adc uh, it does decimation also because you are uh, accumulating and dumping so therefore while you accumulate and uh, dump this number then uh, you automatically remove certain frequencies completely from the uh, signal you should however make sure that you do not end up eliminating part of your signal okay that none the earliest zero doesn't fall inside your uh, inside inside your uh, signal so now remember you will get a good low pass filter if you average lots but if you average lots then the first zero will come down to a low frequency okay so therefore uh, uh, you have to be very careful while designing uh, this this filter okay however we didn't have the luxury of uh, using just a plain comb filter because we have to we have adaptation to do ah back to square this so then you have essentially these up down counters these up down counters are effectively we have chosen gamma to be one that means you have some n bit coefficient and this coefficient can be either incremented or decremented by one okay so adding gamma what we are what, what are we doing we have discretized this sum of error to one so when it reaches a particular threshold that error reaches a particular threshold then we change the coefficient by one and that is easily done you don't need adders or subtractors which will add some uh, funny number gamma all we are by making gamma equal to one we have, what we have essentially done is that you you can just make do with uh, up down counter so these these are the ones that we have okay and this sign essentially shows what is the sign of the error okay so if the sign of the error is such that the error went up due to your last change then you must go from up to down otherwise you must go from down to up so essentially these coefficients their outputs then these are these a0 a1 a2 and so on right their outputs are going to the fir okay those are the coefficients that i'll give to the digital uh, fir so these are registered but the value of that register is being incremented decremented depending on the error that i accumulate in my dump okay so that is what uh, we are doing that there is this uh, adder subtractor the accumulate out this is the uh, dumper 
and then uh, these are my uh, up down counters okay and this is then the fir filter this is done in digital domain so this is not uh, too bad however there is a fair amount of work to be done because there is multiplication and addition so therefore you have to make sure that you use as little time as possible so then you use a tree adder uh, which will then uh, all as much part can be done in parallel as possible and then those terms are added then acted upon and then those terms are added okay so we use three levels of redundant binary adders are you familiar with uh, redundant addition i just mentioned it in some other in like a booth multiplier okay so this is what uh, we use so essentially we are using twice the number of bits which is necessary okay so every traditional bit is actually represented by two bits that is called re, uh, redundant presentation so in that case essentially you can now represent 0 plus 1 and minus 1 okay recall the similarities that crop up with the pipeline this thing i had discussed when we were discussing the pipeline that we need to represent 0 1 and minus 1 in redundant addition again that thing comes up and it is the same trick that i had discussed with you at that time that is to say i'll just uh, illustrate what you do is you take this conversion is done once and for all after that all our adders all our subtractor all our arithmetic assumes that the input is in redundant form okay now because we are using two bits per traditional bit so we have a wider than necessary world however we do have the luxury of representing at each place value 0 1 or minus 1 so we use only three of the four possible symbols okay now the point is that if the traditional binary number is something like this now this number has place values okay so the local place value of all these bits combined right so this is 5 bits which is 31 okay so rather than representing it as 31 locally 31 multiplied by 2 to the power m where the place value here is 2 to the power m right so all of these bits together are 31 times whatever is the local place value at that point so what we do is that we represent it as 1 1 bar okay so 32 is being represented as 32 minus 1 so we look for consecutive runs of 1 and replace that entire run of 1s by a 1 to the left of it and a minus 1 at the last position okay so for example 8 minus 1 will give you 7 so if you have three ones here this will be replaced by okay sorry right so the whole idea is that when you are done with converting then notice that now this each letter that you see on the paper is actually 2 bits because I need to be able to represent 1 as well as uh, minus 1 whatever representation I choose for that right. So this representation is now twice as wide as this but in terms of significance you never have consecutive ones you can have consecutive zeros but you can never have consecutive ones. If you do not have consecutive ones then the carry will never repel okay. So I will de design special adders which understands this uh, bit arithmetic but the carry will never repel because it is if there is a 1 anywhere there is a 1 then to the left of it a 0 is always guaranteed to be there because had there been 2 consecutive ones it would have been replaced by 1 bar uh, 1 okay. So if you have done the conversion then it turns out that the output is also in redundant form. So you design hardware so that it does this very very fast and does it in redundant hardware okay. So once you have done the conversion from binary to redundant all the rest addition etc can be done 
in uh, redundant arithmetic. And if you have this, then it is very fast. So now you can use standard headers rather than carry look ahead or whatever. You because you are guaranteed that carry will never ripple. So if carry doesn't ripple, then you can use ordinary headers, which reduce. Now you had lost in terms of number of bits, but now you have gained in the complexity of the digital design because you don't have to use very complicated headers. So you use this. And what is a multiplier? A multiplier is just a tree adder. Okay. So over and above this, you use the Booth algorithm, right? So the Booth algorithm is essentially an implicit version of the same. What you are saying is, for example, if you want to multiply something by seven, then rather than multiplying it by seven, you multiply by eight and subtract one, right? This is what Booth algorithm does. So it implicitly is doing the same thing anyway. But now addition subtraction is done of quantities which are themselves represented in the redundant arithmetic. Okay, so the up down position is done in the booth sense, and each individual item which you are adding or subtracting is represented as a uh, is, is 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 represented as a uh, binary uh, as a redundant binary. Number. Why is it called redundant? Not just two bits, because the representation of a number is not unique. There are multiple representations of the same number. Okay, so that means if you have a number, then I can tell you, can't tell you that this number will be represented thusly. So there can be multiple representations because of the two bits. Of course, it is because that you have too many bits, and then the principal form of redundant arithmetic is one in which all consecutive ones have been replaced by that one bar one. So that is what we used in the uh, digital part of this. There is some latency, but uh, essentially, what it uh, generally what happens is that the act of conversion itself can become slow because you have to serially look whether there is a run of ones and so on. So therefore, what you do is that you do a partial removal. So for you will you can guarantee that, for example, uh, all Runs of four would have been eliminated. So you could have eliminated more ones. Suppose there are seven ones, but then you will stop at four, and then do the next three. Okay. So therefore, you guarantee that the that a, any one bar will have definitely have a zero, but it won't have too many zeros at that point. So the overall work that you do is actually better. And in fact, I am now tempted to look at it because you might actually re reduce the power. In spite of the redundancy, because the number of bits which change is relatively small. What happens is that when the carry ripples, the summer says some bit, and then carry flips it, and then the carry ripples through. So there are too many transitions created. So it is possible. I have not looked that this actually might, in spite of using more bits than necessary, might actually reduce the total power of uh, addition. So then we do this booth level addition if necessary uh, according to the booth alg algorithm three levels and this is essentially our multiplier. So in short, we have a very fast multiplier. Then we did the system design RTL code for the digital part, then the standard cell layout for that, then did the simulation and of course uh, this is a, your signal to noise ratio. So this is the signal. At this particular value, and the noise floor is somewhere here. So, what are the non-idealities considered for this? Essentially, the signal that we are feeding to it, we are assuming that the leakage factor is 0.98. Leakage factor simply says that the gain is not quite infinite, and it essentially, therefore, the amount of the low-order error which comes in is cancelled. To 0.98, that means 0.02 times the low order error still uh, leaks through, and that there is there are other kinds of noise which are important like KT by C noise and capacitor ratio error, okay, and that the DC op amp gain is finite. So all these things are considered in that. And then you go ahead and simulate and find out finally did you get something uh, substantive or not, and in spite of all of this, again. For example, if this is the ideal curve, 
you only approach the ideal curve okay you are still away from the ideal curve but you at least you have come reasonably close to the ideal curve by uh, doing this okay now it is interesting that having done that how is the adaptation occurring after all we have chosen some arbitrary values of gamma we have said that gamma is 1 but the block factor will then decide how quickly or how slowly you are converging so what we have done here essentially is you you start out this is a brute brute filter you start out with all zeros do not start out with an actual uh, expectation of the transfer function okay start out with all coefficient zero and then see how long it takes before the coefficients settle down to a value okay and that means that before this much time has passed and this is quite a lot of uh, cycles I do not know whether, yeah you can you can read it much better than I can this terminal is very bad. So essentially it takes 2000 milliseconds, 2 seconds before this starts giving good values. Once settled now as long as this guy remains on it is going to because now the deviations are going to be small it is going to be able to cope with them reasonably but otherwise it takes as much as uh, 2 seconds uh, for that uh, for it to settle down. So therefore if we were not patient and did not let it settle down uh, and uh, did not simulate it with that then you would have thought that we, we have achieved nothing because you are still getting terrible amount of error. So it requires effectively 2 seconds of actual signal simulation before you start getting the actual value. So it, these results are actually produced with real blood sweat and tears. Now this is the coefficient noise okay so it tells you uh, so what we do is we choose a k and then we try various k's and keep on looking at these things and say how much is the coefficient noise because this, this is the trade off that we have either have more coefficient noise or have a quicker settling system. So finally you find out the value of k factor which will give you acceptable coefficient noise and at the same time give you reasonable uh, convergence time. I think the rest I am going to skip it is essentially lots of colorful uh, representation of something which is quite trivial. This is the VHDL part of that. So she has a VHDL model of the digital part of this entire circuit. So it just does the digital simulation says that it is doing the multiplication correctly. Okay. So finally we moved if you notice in the path of this mtech uh, project from 0.35 where we had started by the time we ended up at that time by the way uh, 0.35 and 0.25 were considered very advanced technologies so we had gone from 0.35 to quarter micron technology uh, ended up at quarter micron technology with a supply voltage of 3.3 volts at that time and we could which one no, this was essentially we wanted the analog circuits to work and have as high a dynamic range as possible. So there were two quarter micron technologies available at that time, one which had a lower voltage and one which would provide you with uh, 3.3 and the other advantage with this was that design we mm, did not end up processing it but the point is that if you have a 3.3 volt uh, chip then it is much easier to interface it with standard external digital things. If you have something which works of 1.5, 1.6 or some such thing then you have to bring up so this is what we have with the current uh, silicon foundry. So we thought that oh, all right since this technology is available let us use the 3.3 volts but for analog design you know, op amp and so on it was much easier to design the analog components with a uh, relatively high voltage. The digital performance was not the best possible because it was not a properly scaled technology. The oxide was a little thicker than this. Yeah. But notice that this is meaning this is not cheap. Uh, the it is not as if we have got some very simple uh, sim simple circuit and it works there is enough digital most of this in spite of having a sigma delta uh, this thing the digital part has become so complex that it is almost uh, uh, consuming a watt here okay. So essentially uh, about 25 to 30 dB increase in SNR 
uh, which is possible theoretical because of cancellation what we actually achieved was about 18 to 20 degrees ok and I do not have time to go through this, but maybe some other time we will take up. There are two modes of this adaptation. One has a standard signal in which you know the output. The other is that you use this use the ordinary signal itself as the, the test signal. So, then the point is that there are algorithms which will use standard signal itself and it, it will try to correct itself. Then why use a mode in which the A to D is not available, you have to use a test signal. 